Welcome back, guys, to the Beyond Condition podcast, the voice of bodybuilding and today's voice, who was just falling asleep, ties into our <laughs> ties into our topic today. My Matt has joined us for an episode to essentially talk about his journey of accepting sleep apnea. So, as always, thank you for your time today. I think sometimes people might think, why are you thanking him? He's your other half. But I'm grateful for you joining me today, and I'm sure the listeners will be. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be back on and talking about a very interesting topic, mm. one that I've fought off for many years. Well, actually, as well, to note previous episodes you've been on, it sort of ties into accepting things, right? So we did one about body dysmorphia, body image, your own acceptance of your body and being able to share that with the listeners from a male point of view but anyone that's listened you know it relates to male and female and actually am I going to say his name right Oct- Octavia is that right it's along those lines I, I'm, I'm going to have to well he's going to listen I'm sure you were talking the other day to him about that episode in itself and like you said back in a voice note it's like I think that sometimes potentially, you know, historically that males can maybe put it off a bit. And I've said to you and, and not in a, a flippant way, but it's almost easier for men sometimes to get bigger because you just fill out bigger T-shirts and it's like, oh, I look sick. And then feeding that into actually how that feels as a male. So if, if you haven't listened to that episode, very, very cool episode on accepting that. And then we've also spoken about well, I've spoken about a lot of how you've helped me with my own body image and my food behaviours as well. And then we spoke about scale weight on a, I think it was two hours and a quarter episode. And we were like, we could record for about four hours here. But the common theme and the reason I want to mention this is that for both of us, we've, we've essentially got to this day where we are right now by dealing with a lot of stuff together to then accept which ties into of course what we're going to talk about today so in this episode we're going to talk about what sleep apnea is we're going to talk about sleep in general as well because I think that's important because you know sleep apnea of course is a diagnosis and it is a sleep condition but it's going to be incredibly useful to just highlight some of the things about sleep in general for people that maybe don't want to hear as much about sleep apnea but they're interested in that and then also how you've integrated the machine, being able to utilise that, what that involves. I've joked with Matt already to say he's probably going to take you guys on quite a few journeys into rabbit holes. When he gets on a tangent, which we noticed on the Zoom call the other day with our clients and our little community, that you become quite passionate and in the rabbit hole vibe. Now, what I will do today, of course, is guide the conversation, but simplify some of the things that you talk about as well because for me when we've we've been through this journey of the sleep apnea sometimes it's like I need it in layman terms and I work slightly differently to you I then build up my knowledge from there whereas you go straight in (laughs) at the extensive research and knowledge into something so you know it to the nth degree and then that's going to be quite useful for the listeners because it's like Sometimes it can almost be a bit overwhelming, can't it? To when you know so much about something, yeah, and then it's you know almost picking it apart for people to understand. Now, something that I've introduced not long ago is starting each episode with asking the guest if they could turn back time to when they started bodybuilding, mm. what advice would they give themselves? So this can be sleep apnea aside, but it's almost like a a bit of a talking point, and the listeners know me. I'm able to then utilise whatever you say, because you didn't know I was going to ask you this. I didn't. To then be able to feed this into our topic today. So the the biggest valuable lesson or, you know, in hindsight, if you were to go right back to the start of the bodybuilding journey, Mm -hmm. is there like a, you already know it, I believe, because you're, yeah. Yeah, You want to share it with the group? (laughs) Yeah. Go on. It would be invest in myself faster and to a higher degree. And that would be in education and seeking out mentors to take me where I need to go way faster. 
the great thing about doing this now to anyone who's listening and at that point is there's way better people now and there's way more knowledgeable people i mean there's also a host of people who you should avoid but for the most part and this is something that i'm incredibly grateful for for my own coaching journey because when i came out into the space of coaching i jumped on like phil learning's aqa then went straight into matt nutrition uni and i've like systematically just happened upon these very great people to educate myself but i've always said that that investment has been uh, somewhat selfish it hasn't just been to progress my clients it's also been to take care of my own stuff and know what i'm doing and when i went into my own bodybuilding stuff my own fitness stuff it was like buy Arnold Schwarzenegger's bodybuilding bible essentially read through that try and understand that so what I would rejig is learn anatomy and physiology from the off and then deep dive into nutrition from the off and then deep dive into more of the kind of training specificity side of stuff coupled with the anatomy and physiology and fast track 15 years probably into sub five and have better results and have more longevity and be smarter um, and that would come simply from investment into myself and that would be 100 percent. there wouldn't be anything else that i would that i would do and it would be the same for my career i would do i would go even more into that and accelerate that even more mm, for sure we actually had this conversation with my some of the listeners might know but my own rehabilitation from the surgery I've actually got someone taking care of my training now Josh who's a friend of yours mm -hmm. and we both said didn't we that it's really cool to watch through the video that he sent me of my essentially the analysis of what's going on my posture you know dominant sides etc cetera, etc cetera. and for both of us we were like actually you know it's continued education into yes it's knee surgery and it's specific to that but even the level of detail he's gone into bikini poses and what that does to the anatomy and it's stuff I already know but then it's almost like when you then see someone else talk about it and go through it and dissect it in a different way it furthers your learning into it because it's it's an external person saying it in a different way and it's like yeah, I knew that. Oh, actually, that solidifies it. And I think that's super important as well to also not deal in absolutes. We talk about this a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see posts on social media, when you learn from certain people, maybe your coach, people around you, absolutes, you know, yes, maybe sometimes they're appropriate, but more than likely or not, there's so many different versions of the, the stuff we consume that actually speaking, it's person dependent. And I always remember that myself when I when I learn something or pick up something or something works for me, I always keep an open mind into when it's working with clients or what I might change in the future. I don't tend to, you know, post and say this is the only way because there's so many different interpretations and actually your circumstances may change. Now, feeding into what you said there about what you would have sort of changed, as it were, on your journey as a coach and for your own physique, when we then look at the sleep apnea diagnosis, Matt, which which you can talk about, actually invested time and money into a specialist in Thailand. Now, what you can do with a lot of things in life, and you know, if we talk about medical conditions, right, you can, of course take some information and then interpret it how you will. And then you go off and you either take medication or you're given a set of exercise or whatever it may be, depending on the case. But what you can, of course, do if funds allow is actually pursue getting more information. Now, like I said, with Matt going down rabbit holes, you know, you personally need to understand something to the nth degree almost to accept it. Mm -hmm. and there's going to be people listening because this is a trait I see in bodybuilders as well and not just bodybuilders people that are extremely professional or there's there's many examples but understanding something to the nth degree is, is certainly I've never seen it in a person like I have you and it's a compliment but you can also attest to that actually there's pros and cons to thinking in that way because sometimes again we can talk about this more but 
you can become quite obsessive about something mm-hmm. again feeds into many of the listeners you know uh, bodybuilding speaking my about myself as well you know there's certainly addictive traits in both of us hence why we've pursued what we've pursued and we're here addicted now to each other. yeah addicted to each other that has replaced a lot of addictions actually but you know it, it is certainly almost like a talking point to understand your personality type and what works for you and you pursuing that enabled you to get a full understanding build rapport with a specialist and understand it to a level that perhaps you know someone might be listening who maybe has sleep apnea or doesn't know they they think they might have it maybe hasn't had the diagnosis and you've got to understand it to a level that helps you transfer into then accepting it as a part of your life so Perhaps probably the best way to start would be maybe when you started to think about that you maybe had sleep apnea and a general overview into what sleep apnea is for those that don't know. Yeah. So when it comes to a lot of this as well, so if you're listening to this going, I don't have sleep apnea, a lot of this is going to also cross over when we talk about the interventions and the things that I implemented will cross over into just improving your sleep in general. And Mm. anyone who's listening to this is clearly after some form of progression with their own their own whether that's bodybuilding lifestyle whatever it might be developing your physique your mind your brain or at least you know pursuing some form of longevity and as we know it now sleep is one of the most if not the most important thing that you can do that has a cross-reference and positive net effect on literally everything that you do including how you feel psychologically and everything else that goes forward so there will be things that you can use in this and people should be using in this if you just want to even just push the needle of progression on your physique and you aren't doing some of these things and the cool thing about this and I spoke about this on my story just before we hopped on here is the fact that when I'm going down this route we can have our whoops and we can have our aura rings and we can have our dream two headbands and we can monitor the things that are going on in there this software that comes with the CPAP machine you can actually see where your obstructions are and you can see temperature you can see like all of the things that I'm split testing and changing one thing at a time and how that's impacting my actual sleep quality and you could cross-reference that over and I've spoken to the neurologist about this in Thailand you could cross that reference that over in terms of improvements against people who also don't have sleep apnea you could see the neurological benefits and the physiological benefits from this so in terms of like how long I I think I've probably had it for a good 10 years is it actually that long yeah I would say like and and the earliest recollections of this is when I escalated my body weight way up as a a mere natty padawan concerned with only and this cross references over to the previous podcast that we did about self-image where I pushed my body weight up so high and I just got so obsessed with being like because I used to be like nine stone obviously everyone used to be nine stone at some point but like soaking wet through as an adult and I wanted to be heavier so then it was like 10 stone 11 stone 12 stone and I was like very very strong at that point for my body weight but I was also then waking myself up and I would shock myself awake and like jump out of bed and it wasn't always like that that would drop off and dip off a little bit but certainly for a a very extended period of time it's been noted that I snore very heavily very loudly Um, like not helpful when you're in prep guys (laughs) wake (laughs) myself up like you can hear me through walls right like through floors of buildings like that's how loud it is and I would say that the the only sort of time where it's got much much worse was when through going assisted and I would note that I was waking up feeling a lot more tired a lot more fatigued now that isn't to say that going assisted did that but what it is to say is the time spent being there and then my body weight isn't going to go down like if I'm doing all the things that I'm doing when I'm natural and then I'm taking performance hands and drugs guess what I'm going to get a lot more muscular I'm going to put a lot more dense weight on my frame and as a byproduct of that like I always used to struggle to dip below 100 kilo like I was used to struggle to keep above 100 kilos and now I struggle to get below 100 kilos like just walking around doesn't really matter what I'm doing Mm. so that is going to exacerbate because body weight is one of those things um, that will increase it. And in terms of what sleep apnea is, it's an issue where you are waking yourself up or you are unable to sleep consistently without having 
these sort of mild to severe episodes and they can be there's kind of like three categories that all come through you've got obstructive which is basically where something is blocking your airway and your ability to breathe and then you have sort of more of a central version which is a discombobulation between your brain and the muscles that are then not being told to relax and then you are obstructing your breathing um, airways and then you also have complex which is basically a mix of the two so most people's are is obstructive um, and then the rarer is more of the central in terms of like you know danger wise they're all pretty much as dangerous as each other and I say dangerous because essentially what this means is and i can use my example um when i went into the hospital so when i went into the hospital i went in for like an assessment they kind of did a questionnaire and then i went and had a, a sleepover at the hospital our first night apart yeah <laughs> first night apart it was very very strange very weird but i went into the the hospital it was like a proper like apartment bedroom it was amazing you're doing selfies yeah you know. <laughs> but there was a camera watching you which was a little bit weird uh, it's not the first time but there was <laughs> there was all of these nodes and i've got like the pictures and everything and the videos and there were basically nodes all over my head all over my throat uh, over my chest and then also over your legs and they basically take like monitors of your resting heart rate and then you have to sleep and during the the sleep they will then wake you up and kind of change you into different positions so they can see how you sleep on your back they can see how you sleep on the side on the other side if you can sleep face down and then you can also sleep with the mask so they want to basically assess what your sleep is like and you can get there like really early so you can settle in and you can kind of do everything so I was like really relaxed and chilled and apart from having all the wires and things on but I wouldn't say that my sleep was any real different so when we're diagnosing sleep apnea there are these events and they are measured through like AHI is essentially what it's abbreviated to, which is basically how many of these obstructive or complex events you're having through a night. So five and under is what is kind of desirable or under five is really desirable. Five to 15 is considered mild symptoms. 15 to 30 is considered like moderate really and you should definitely do something about it and then 30 and above is severe so mine where an average of 46 per hour so that's 46 events per hour per hour of sleep extrapolated over and i slept for like eight i think it was like seven hours and 50 odd minutes during that time so i think that clocks up to being like you know 600 700 events um yeah. roughly and i peaked at 60 so 60 was the most and I think 27 was the least over a period of time and I stopped breathing for 57 seconds at one point so that was the longest part where I was holding my breath and this is essentially where you label it like an event because this is where when you first came home and you said I've got my report and everything and you were like I had this many events and I'm thinking what are you talking about mm. and what does that mean but essentially it's it's where the sleep apnea is affecting your sleep isn't it and and yeah. that gets marked on, like you're describing, you know, with the nodes, the, the chart, basically. And then they can dissect the data and, and give you that feedback. Yeah, yeah. And you see absolutely everything. So when you're strapped into this machine and it has all the nodes, it can see when you stop breathing at this point. Why do you stop breathing? Is that something that's happening within your brain that is shutting off and relaxing the muscles that are then obstructing? Or is it the fact that you are your lungs aren't able to inflate appropriately during that time? Is it the fact that like your tongue is blocking your airways? Like whatever it might be, they're able to ascertain what that is. And then that comes back into this report. And then we can see from the data because we set up like the, the first machine that I used to basically set it between a range. And what happens with the machine is the machine is set up for a certain amount of pressure and the pressure is how much forceful air is pushed into your, your body and then how your body responds to that. So it'll basically go through a range and they'll start you off smaller and then they'll escalate up through that number. And then we saw those numbers come down and my numbers came down to around the, the kind of teen mark. So they're around like the 14-ish. So right down from like 46 all the way to that point. And then they give you this data and that data then is made into a report and then you come back to speak to the neurologist. And then when I came back to speak to the neurologist, they were like, yeah, so that's really bad. Um, so you need to have a machine to essentially do this. And the the thing is, and and 
this is the point right where I avoided it for a period of time because it was like well I can still get by and I can still do everything and because of my knowledge because of my experience in everything that I was doing within clients and also I changed my sleep routine and rituals massively when I read Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep I was like yeah I don't want to have on my gravestone died because didn't bother sleeping properly Mm -hmm. um so that made me drastically change like a large degree of my sleep hygiene and my sleep routine and all of this compared to what it was before which would be like working till like one o'clock waking up working again at four o'clock and basically just doing that because I was didn't have anything else in my life that was like really what I wanted to do or what I you know outside of that it was just a big rabbit hole that I was down maybe maybe also not the concern for your health that you could have had because Mm. I think that this relates into the the body dysmorphia one of well I don't really care you know I'll, I'll just take each day as it comes and if I'm rolling the dice I'm rolling the dice and that is related to how severe sleep apnea can be and the detrimental effects over time but also you know it's it's life-threatening if you're leaving it and it's important you know and it is as well just to know it's quite common in bodybuilders and heavily muscled individuals and that's not just males it's also females but it's also related to you don't have to be heavily muscled it can be of course overweight but also it can be something that is not affecting you because of your body weight as well yeah, there's so many things that can impact it and it can be you know something that's genetic as well like just from your predisposition like we spoke about in terms of the things that can be obstructive for you it can be how your body is just built i.e you know the the lady who is the neurologist like said that my tongue is overly large for my mouth and i was like well oh. i've but, got a voice note for that yeah for that uh information but where, where you said about changing your sleep routine this is also something that a bit of a side tangent, but it's something we see in clients and it's something we saw in ourselves that actually, you know, there was levels of us needing to meet halfway to a certain degree with what we were both doing with the sleep routine. So when we got together, I used to be in bed by half eight and that was that was my standard. And you, where you reference sort of, 1 a.m sometimes or it wasn't that late by the time we sort of got together a couple of years ago but it would be 11 maybe something like this and that was quite difficult as and people might be able to relate you see you know not everyone but going into a new partnership and and being quite a a big difference you know you know how I was and it's still very largely the same in regards to how I treat bodybuilding but that was my only concern in life to a certain degree, you know, everything had to be nailed. So actually, I think that it's a relevant point that, you know, you knew how good sleep was and what was needed there, but you could still get pulled into work. And this is why we relate to to clients so much, because it's not always as simple as listening to a podcast or, you know, reading an ebook or something like this, because we easily slip into old habits so there was certainly meeting in the middle for that to actually go, okay, so I could go to bed a bit later, latest 10, we agreed, you know, ideally setting down by half nine, and then you could pull it back and we could meet in the middle. Again, a level of acceptance into sharing a life with someone and and that feeding into, again, getting a diagnosis because, and, you know, we can be honest with it, there was times when we needed to sleep in separate beds, mm-hmm. particularly in my prep, because... Uh, you know sleep is very very affected in a prep and the the snoring like I think that I think one of the things for you which you've mentioned before and we didn't really speak about it you know to the nth degree as it were but you went through ebbs and flows I know you you said about almost being a bit embarrassed about that or or feeling a bit conscious about that Mm. now our relationship's very open and and we don't really have any barriers or or anything we we worry about between ourselves but maybe that would be a, a sort of good thing to talk about as well with that feeding into like being quite hard to accept because that's where you were you were feeding into anyway yeah I think a lot of it is the unknown as to like what it means uh, I think we've <clears throat> we've often seen the sleep apnea machines and the CPAP and the mask and like wearing that and it's such a a visual representation of accepting the fact that you've got this thing and 
sleep in with something like I remember putting a sleep mask on for the first time and taking like months for it to be like first and foremost just for it to feel comfortable to wear a sleep mask but as we've ascertained from moving to many diff different places light bleeding into a room destroys your sleep for the most part so that was a necessity but then wearing a sleep mask in front of someone that you're sharing a bed with was like and like wearing a nasal strip even that <laughs> is like this is how I go to sleep and people will <laughs> like people will say these things now and they'll be like so you wear a sleep mask and blah 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 and blah 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 in front of Sarah and it's like yeah motherfucker I don't care like I didn't know that no but like people will say like oh is it okay you have the yeah, yeah 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 and it's just like what I need to do to get a good night's sleep like at this point if someone who's with me is going to judge me based upon that fuck them like but it's taken a long time to get to that point where it's like, you know, and that isn't to say, you know, it's disrespectful. This is something I'm going to separately talk about. But when you're with someone and when you're actually invested in someone and like the conversations that we've had, if you're trying to do something to better your health, to better yourself, and it's not having a negative impact on the other person, but you're literally trying to just do something to improve. And that other person isn't there going, this is fucking awesome, let's fucking do this. The person that you're with is not the right person. Mm -hmm. And if you don't agree with that, then that's fine. But trust me, you'll agree with it in a few years or a few months <laughs> time. Like, it's just fact. You'll come back and be like, ah, nah, you know what, on a podcast, you were right. Because it's a stone cold fact. And this is the thing about finding the right person, because I don't think about it when I've got to put the sleep apnea machine on like from oh, what are you going to think what I've never thought any of that stuff oh, yeah, doing that. yeah and it's never even come into my mind or a consideration even when it's like all the other shit that I fucking got to do to get ready for bed and to actually you know survive a night's worth of sleep which is essentially what it is because you're like dying many times in whilst you're sleeping yeah. so that speaks volumes as to where I was at from a confidence perspective way back when is the fact that and I don't even know what it would be like trying to get a diagnosis way back when because even now it's like you know you try and look at places and find places and I found places for clients and people who asked me about it <clears throat> to get a full assessment because I think you can do home sleep tests and sleep studies for sure um I did one of those when I was in Australia like like years and years and years ago it came back and it was like no, you, you're pretty much sound. I definitely knew that I wasn't, but I was like, well, if it says that I'm sound, I guess I'm sound, so it's fine. Again, this is the nth degree conversation, isn't it? About sometimes if you believe something's not right, again, it's, you know, finances is, is going to often be a sticking point for a lot of people. Mm. But if you're not feeling that something's right in area, any area of life, pursuing that and that's where I said to you we will find the money you know because you need to be able to understand what is going on and this is not a joke and and with the acceptance as well you know I think partially that sort of where we did have to transition to sit in separate beds at some times and, and things like this it can't go on like that because we're a couple and, and we share our life and that's the difference it's not I don't give a fuck about the other person I'm snoring. It's a different dynamic and you have to care for the other person at times. And there's it's a, a double-sided thing, isn't it? You know, someone has sleep apnea and I feel for you and, and what's happened in this journey, you know, having to put the mask on every night. And it's something that I would find very hard to accept because it, it I mean, I get claustrophobic. So that's the main reason, but it is a big thing. So I can feel for you, but then on the, the other side, it's like, it's going to be limited if we can sleep together with snoring because, and it, and it's not, there's no ill feeling there. Whereas I speak to so many females that are like, fucking hell, I haven't had a night's sleep for ages because my husband snores. And obviously there is a difference between snoring <laughs> and, you know, sleep nice apnea, but I think that's, that's a relevant point in regards to, you know, actually, if you are thinking there's something more and you have a home study and you think I'm not sure this is right pursuing if you can sort of going down the private route would be would be something to consider yeah for sure and there's like the nhs is a route that you can go down if you're in the uk if you're in another country then it's a lot easier to kind of book in and get something sorted but there are places in the uk that you can find to do that because i've had consults with people who have wanted to go down that route of doing it since I've been speaking about it mm. and 
it can be done and it can be you can be found and then the route forward is based upon your your data your feedback but it is something to take seriously if you are looking for longevity in your health because the ramifications are you can die like that's and and going down the route of treatment you see this and i've read you know the importance of continuing to wear it and it's not just one or two things in mm. the, the state that this is this is true but when you start your therapy of doing it it's essentially a lifelong commitment for you to do that and there are things that you can do and there are transitional things that you can improve over a period of time but that is depending on what your diagnosis is and you know let's say you lose 10 percent of your body weight again if that's even possible because if you're a bodybuilder and you're looking to gain size you're not going to be doing that but what you can do and this is something that i spoke to with a neurologist and this was the cool thing about the neurologist in thailand is like they're obviously into their job and then when they receive someone and not everyone's like this some people like some doctors and like people find it annoying when you find a good one i'm going to say a good one because it makes my day when you get someone who's receptive to you learning and then you go away and you do what that you need to do and they're like oh this is cool let's delve, delve a little bit deeper so when we were talking about it you could do exercises and breathing exercises and you can do tongue exercises and you can no in- comment for anyone that's not watching <laughs> and you can increase like the muscularity and you can make sure that your breathing capabilities because it is essentially you're having that air forced into your airways on becoming lazy essentially so when i'm programming now i've kind of drilled into myself that i'm kind of doing all this mobility stuff that working with my tongue doing these breathing exercises before i put my apnea mask on but also when i wake up and i take it off i'm breathing deep into my diaphragm when i'm doing my fasted cardio i'm breathing nasal breathing in through my diaphragm trying to really pull down that air and fill my lungs as we're going through and even periods through the day it's like a conscious effort as soon as I think about it if I talk about something that's related to sleep with a client I'm like "Ah, yeah okay those things again these are things that you can do that not only make sure that you're not getting lazy or body's not getting lazy by using the machine but they can also increase and improve the amount of events that you're having through a night and they're just not, not going to be a net negative anyway in terms of your overall life experience. But there are multiple things that you can do. But without doing these things, you are going to notice negative health consequences that are going to go forward, whether or not that's just the things to leading into poorer sleep in the sense of you're going to find it harder to build muscle or you're going to find it harder to lose body fat completely from body fat stores and not lose some muscle mass mm-hmm. or whether it is, you know, more hypertension prone blood pressure readings which is a big thing and again for assisted bodybuilders that's again something else that you're more than likely managing through some other mediation of medication but these are all things that are going to impact that and there are then further cardiovascular events and you know we're talking strokes we're talking heart attacks that are potentiated and increased exponentially by just having sleep apnea if you think about it when I'm holding my breath for 57 seconds, what do you think my body's doing? My body is starving my brain of oxygen. My heart rate is going to shoot up. Like my resting heart rate can be 120, 130 whilst I'm asleep and essentially waking myself up. So all of these things are things that if you just ignore them, as guys often do, and I'm sure that females will also do this as well, but it's a, a well-known uh, what you a thought process. It's thought process of men, right? Like, if I don't go and get it checked out, if I don't go and have the test, then it's just something that I I learn to live with every single day and I can exist by doing that. The thing that was really the turning point for me was us not being able to stay in the same room, in the same place. Like it's like, I don't want to live like that because we had the period of time where we were and then it was like, uh, like this can't be a thing because I'm the problem in terms of doing that. And that's not off the back of you, but it's like, I can do something about it. And before I don't give a shit, like I snore. So what, like you just have to pull with it. Like, that's just what I was doing, not to you, but previous partners, like, because that's just who I was. And I'm not going to even apologize for that because it's just who I was. And I'm fine with that. Uh, That was just the, they were just the wrong people. Right. Um, so this is where that pushed me to that. And then having it was like, okay, this is very bad. And 
I need to do something about it. And then it was the geek mode of like, okay, now I need to know everything about it Mm. because now I need to improve it. Because if I'm going to learn something about whatever, you know this and you say like, it's my, my thing where I just go deep into it. You give me access to the test. You give me access to all this data. You would say that I love data. I love interpreting data and then seeing what I can move and manipulate with it. You couple that with adding in a neurologist that I can speak to as much as I want to, and then being able to feed back off the back of that data, that's going to lead me down the rabbit hole. And then the rabbit hole of that is then, right, what are the options? And if you've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, then the options are, well, there's a few. There's like dental procedures, there's operations that you can have. And again, this will come off the back of what your diagnosis is. So you can move and manipulate things like your body weight and see how that impacts it. You can have if those obstructions are things that can be surgically changed. So again, if you've got like narrow nasal passages, and this is something that they check for, like if you've got inflammation there, if it's chronic inflammation in there, then these are things that can be operated on. Again, that can be quite severe for some people to take down that consideration of that. Mm -hmm. And then there are dental uh, interventions that can be made. So there can be things that you can wear that aren't necessarily a sleep apnea machine. And then there is the sleep apnea machine. Now, generally speaking the sleep apnea machine is the 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 go-to because it just it works right now the caveat to that is you have to wear something across your face there's also two different types isn't there yeah and and then this is a thing when you go in and the mask side of stuff and something else that put me off is when i had my beard and it was like to the level that it was that can break the seal or that can impact the seal around it so that's almost like a reason not to do it but obviously that's not a reason anymore to the level that my beard is at the moment and (laughs) more of a stubble vibe yeah and then when it came to this and this was something that was great for the experience i was able to use a couple of machines and there's an fmp machine and then there is the resmed machine and these are kind of the two mainstays of the machines that go through and there is differences between them and there is also differences between the masks that you'll wear as you kind of experience. And what I would say to anyone who has the opportunity to do this, whether or not that is the opportunity to rent them or whether this is the opportunity to find someone, this obviously if you've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, have different machines and you can use them. There is merit in using different ones because I've spoken to many different people and I felt the difference immediately when I spoke to the neurologist and spoke to the technicians who were in there plugging me in. I was like, it can there be that much of a difference because surely it's just pressure in this and that and the other. And there is a massive difference because I swapped between the two and then I swapped back between the two and then I swapped between different masks and I found the one that worked best for me. And that was the ResMed. It's like a ResMed Air Sense for her, but it's actually for him. And then the mask that I use is a full mask. So I did try the nose mask, but it just felt really, really weird. And even though this allows me to shut my mouth finally, and then breathe in through my nose. And that's something that I practice. So when you are experiencing, this is something I spoke to the technicians about, when you're experiencing it for the first time, wearing it in the day can really help just to... While you're conscious. Yeah, just to breathe and get used to how the breathing is because it's going to be very, very strange. And the first time that I experienced it, it was like a whoosh of air that was just being shoved into my face. And my, basically it blew through my nose and came out through my mouth. And I was just like, this is a really weird sensation. And putting the mask on, I will say, touching on your claustrophobia, I don't have claustrophobia. I don't feel confined in spaces. Like I wouldn't go cave in, but I think that's because, you know, what happens if it floods and then you die? Like mm-hmm. what a shit way to die. He's been um, analytical, guys. <laughs> yeah risk assessment yeah risk assessment is like that's a terrible way to go so absolutely not so i just want to put myself there but it is quite a a sensation when you wake up and you've got that and i think this comes from certainly from my perspective over the time you watch films every time someone's in hospital they've got that like Mm -hmm. oxygen mask on there right or you see the oxygen mask when you got on a plane and they say if this comes down then wear that it's the only thing that you can think of because you never wear anything on your face to that level conscious thought process that it's related to that yeah Mm. yeah and that was something that took quite a while to get used to because i would wake up and this thing would be on my face and i'd be like (gasps) and getting used to the adjustments because there are adjustments depending on the mask that you have, depending on the straps that you have, depending on like where, like so mine adjusts over four points from Velcro. So like over 
the cheeks essentially and then above your forehead so either side of the crown it's quite the piece yeah uh, uh, let's just what is the cpap machine called he's called steve cpap steve yeah so we need to throw that in there actually you know on a on a side note because people are going to be have to be digesting your your various rabbit holes that actually making it a bit fun and, and taking the edge off a bit i think that sometimes when something a dynamic changes in life or you're diagnosed with something or you occur a, a challenge or any of these things we can often focus on the negatives and focus on oh my god you know i've got to accept this for the rest of my life and uh, this pending sense of doom and you, again you can get into a negative mindset with it and essentially that can lead to not accepting many many things but actually you know we've we've made it part of the routine because matt cleans the machine and steve I said, yeah i said are you gonna come and get ready with steve and then you are you are you going with steve now <laughs> but after we've had our meal and we start dozing in front of watching reddington if anyone knows who I'm, oh, that was going to be a little, do you know who I'm referencing oh, there? Can edit it. No, I'm not editing it. No, no, you spoiled it. Uh, but if you can make it, you know, a bit fun or take the edge off a bit, like I say, in er any area of life, accepting things, yes, okay, you know, something's pretty acute and it's, it's a difficult time. And I won't, you know, joking aside, it was tough at first when you had the machine at home and, of course, you going down the, the data route to the nth degree and, and everything is very consuming for you. And, and this is something that's good between us because I feel like I can level that out a touch. You do go on tangent sometimes and I've got to let you do your thing. But, you know, Three, actually it, yeah, coming together with someone that you trust or, or your partner, whoever that is, to actually talk through how it feels, you know. And we would talk about it before you even had the sleep test and I had to guys i had to keep on and on and on but at the point where i said to you you know you're risking your health here and and then you sort of had that that revelation where it was like i'm actually stopping us being able to go to bed together and things and, and that changed but you know there's levels of support in a relationship any type of relationship there's also and, and pat said this on the the pod last week there's cheerleaders that just say no it's okay it's okay it's okay but Sometimes you've got to have critical thinkers in life and sometimes you've got to have someone challenge your narrative in order for you to accept something to move forward. And, and that sort of that thought process of that person that is supporting you that can make it a bit fun over time, you've made it fun as well, which it definitely was not something fun. And it's not something that's, you know, jovial, as it were, but we've made it part of our life. And that's that's important because if you resent anything, you know, every night you think of an hour before bed and what's that going to do? It's going to affect your sleep. It's going to affect how you are, potentially a knock-on effect to us. And then it's like, well, what's the point in getting the diagnosis? You might as well not use it. So it's there's levels to it with, with acceptance of anything. But I'm very proud of you as well because, like I say, I I personally would find it very difficult to live with with a mask but you've you've just got on into the rhythm and you've accepted that it is part of your life now something that i wanted to to have as a question for you okay. as well and you've sort of touched on it here about accepting it's a lifelong thing mm. was it scott mcnally that did a podcast about this that we spoke to alex and emily about that some people know. come in and out of it and actually it puts your heart under pressure if you don't yeah. use it yeah so i know that there is potentially bodybuilders that listen or you know you might know a bodybuilder that uses a cpap machine in off season and i i personally know of people that sort of resonate with when they're leaner in a prep or a diet phase they stop using the mask because they believe oh well, i don't need the mask because i'm not having the events in the night and I don't know if you know anything other than sort of our talk with Emily and Alex about it, but in regards to the acceptance of it being a lifelong thing and what what could occur if you sort of go in and out of using it, I'm not sure if you know much about yeah, so it. Yes, there are evidence-based studies on sort of what happens. And 
what I would say is using that threshold. So if you're, you know, a bodybuilder who's going through prep and you're, you know, looking to get leaner and you have access to looking at your events, which you should have if you've got a CPAP, you're looking for your events to be consistently under that, you know, period, that threshold where you're five or under, right? So if you're five or under and you're consistently under that, you should, and this was advice from the neurologist, because over a period of time, you can reduce your events. But realistically speaking, this should be a decision that is based upon the the specialist that you're working with. So rather than you, a person, yeah, you should. Like, oh, yeah. I don't want to fucking use it anymore. Yeah, if you personally do that, be aware that your likelihood of having cardiovascular events, be that stroke or heart attack, go up. I mean, you can chase it all the way up to like 75%. And you can't predict when that's going to happen. Now, the caveat to that is when you're getting leaner and you're a bodybuilder and you're putting yourself under more uh, static load of stress, whether that stims, whether that's pushing yourself to the nth degree, whether that's, you know, reducing your food and creating the allostatic load there. What you have to think about is, yes, the, the strain of my body weight is going down, but the overall strain going on the rest of my body is increasing if your apnea is related only to your body weight then yeah it would make sense that you can cease use over that how many people's is linked directly to their body weight is few and far between where they see all of the other things drop off so a consideration for this is also doing the exercises, making sure that you're doing everything you possibly can to make sure that if you are ceasing use during this time, then your your musculature around your breathing isn't atrophied and you've got you know strong musculature within your mouth and everything else that's going on. And there could also be a stepping stone to move from the apnea to a one of the dental pieces that we were speaking about earlier and this is a conversation for again the specialist and you the things that i've seen and things that i've read and i've read fairly in depth because believe me if i could get off wearing it and have normal sleep and ha have everything else then i absolutely would as much as it is like not a battle to go and do it would i rather just be able to and we talk about this all the time like i remember just closing my eyes and falling asleep not like winding down having my blue light blockers on doing all this kind of stuff that's what we got to do now because we're adults yeah anyway that's boring um so i mean i get off on it yeah well yeah i would just like to close my eyes and go to sleep however that's not going to happen but what i don't want to do is have a stroke in my sleep or have a heart attack in my sleep because that sounds pretty shit so I would like to live as long as possible, especially now we've got what we've got. And that's a motivating factor for me. So my advice to people would be speak to a specialist. If you're looking to get off it, don't make the decision by yourself, especially if you're looking to get off it or you don't like it or you don't get on with it. And believe me, I understand that. What I would say is the way that I've approached it is kind of like progressive overload and everything else. You give me a number so I can now see my You yeah, know you're trying score. to get under one event per night. And sometimes I have to say, look. Yeah, but that's because like I believe that I can get it there and I believe that I can fine tune it. I'm not mad. When my when my events are like under five, I know that that is good. Yeah, but you're but still I striving know. for yeah. the absolute. And sometimes it's about relaxing down. And seeing the under five is a good thing. And then if it's because we know that certain things affect your sleep, which we've picked up on more. Now you're so acutely aware of it. Yeah. And but that's the that's the good thing for me, like, because if I don't care, then it doesn't matter. I'll just carry on doing what I'm doing. Hence why we had those conversations about going to bed earlier and doing all the other stuff and wind it down. Like if I if it doesn't matter that it's not under five. It's like, fuck it, well, whatever. We'll go to bed whenever. Like, I'll just never do like this or that. Or like, I have to have that kind of, it's kind of like the cardio, right? I have to do it every single day. We have to do cardio every day now, guys. Yeah. So Pass the cardio every single day. But that's my, that's my thing. Like I have to kind of do that. It's sort of like setting my day up with being active and doing those things. It's the same way as having that number. I'm not religiously thinking it has to be under one. But if I can get it under one every now and again, it's like fucking sweet. That Bates was good. On that one. Like, what was that? And this is where like making those adjustments and making those things is really cool 
for me because I can see what personally changes my outcome mm. and I can have my beliefs about what changes my outcome and then I can have it either validated or proved incorrect off the back of that and that's that's a that's it's a learning. good thing it is it is a learning process but it is also not being as you rightly say obsessed with those things but that's the same way as if I go into a session when I don't progressively overload that's all right I mean it, it can be a good thing isn't it it's you know I'm, I'm not by any means saying I've always said to you, you know it's a credit to you that you like to have the data and you know if we're, we're going somewhere to stay it's not looking at one review it's looking at all 96 and it's a good thing you know yeah. but but at times like we say you know balancing each other out Sometimes I probably shouldn't lean into my fuck it moments and just go with an idea because it's popped into my head and suddenly I've started a business or something, you know, such like. And if you'd like to buy bobble hats, (laughs) then stay to the end of this episode. But there's, there's, you know, being able to, and, and this will relate to bodybuilding in itself, the obsessive nature that many of us have. We've almost got two ends of the spectrum with that because. I'd rather not know something and just go obsessive in regards to sending myself into a hole. You'd rather know to the nth degree and make sure it's the right decision. So we sort of find somewhere in the middle and we can actually talk about that. that and, and then it's being able to, you know, I'm able to just say it how it is to you. And this is got back to the critical thinking. It's having someone that can actually just say it straight and then you go, okay. And yes, sometimes it might be a little bit upsetting or uncomfortable, but it's not an uncomfortable that we're not here for, you know, it, essentially you're helping each other grow and be able to, you know, if if Matt is in one of his rabbit holes where he's trying to get it under one and he gets it under one for three days in a row and then the fourth day it's 2.5, I can pretty much reel off the numbers because you will talk about that and it's something that, you know, you've almost gone on a little conquest, but off the back of that, the good thing is, that we're making tweaks to your nutrition, we're making tweaks to the bedtime routine, we're picking up things that maybe, like you say, and this is why I wanted to sort of explain it like this, that you wouldn't have seen before as, and it's not necessarily a problem, but it's like, oh, actually, that impacts my sleep maybe 1%. Mm. So it can be a good thing, and then it's that, of course, fine line, and and we have, you know, this sort of perfect balance here where we're able to talk about it but maybe it would be quite interesting for the listeners whether you have sleep apnea or not to talk through and this is probably maybe the last the the last rabbit hole as it were with with data etc but talking about you know how you set the mask up what the pressure because that's been back and forth with the technician and actually the sort of the more intricate details of having the mask and then using it every night and how that sort of transpires because there might be someone listening that suspects they have it you see mm. or has a diagnosis and maybe they're not at that point yet to go I'm going to get the mask there is also again I've, I've mentioned finance before today but getting the mask is of course a, a big financial commitment so maybe a bit about you know the actual mask itself would be quite useful yeah so with the uh, with the mask, a lot of it is coming down to what fits best for you, and trying those different ones on is going to be like you mentioned. Yeah, one hundred percent. And with the data that you can kind of send off and the feedback that you can get, obviously on the app itself, the data that you're going to get is sleep score, which is going to be essentially everything put together from the amount of time that you're using the machine. So that's how much you're actually breathing through it. How many times you take on and off the mask impacts it quite a lot as well. And then you've got the leakage. So this is how much air is actually leaking during that time. And then you've got your events. So based upon that data, and then the machine extrapolates that out. So the events, what the actual events are. So when you've got the leakage, that's obviously like a tightness issue or a fitting issue. So this is where my preconceived idea of like the beard that I had, that mm. would have created some breaks of the seal. Because obviously, if you can imagine something that's pushing air consistently into your face, if you haven't got an airtight seal around 
the mask, then it's going to leak out. And that leak is then going to create an issue in pressure. And then when it's ramping pressure and trying to get you to breathe properly, it's not going to be doing an appropriate job. And this comes into the adjustments that can be made the other side where we're talking about that ramping pressure. So what will happen is you'll set a range. So my initial range was like between six and nine, and essentially it starts off at six. So it will be like a six PSI of like pushing air into you, and then it will basically feed back. So if that's enough to inflate the lungs and allow you to then essentially breathe like a normal person who goes to sleep, then cool, awesome. If not, it will go 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. And then what you will see is along the chart and the chart will for people who can't watch the video if you imagine like several graphs and the graphs are basically lines so amongst those lines you've got the obstruction you've got essentially if your brain is shutting off and you've got what that actual event is along the bottom you will have a chart and it will be like anyone who uses voice notes you know the the, the voice note you know <laughs> the voice notes working right because you can see your voice and going up or down that's essentially what's happening with the pressure. So as the pressure goes up, you see that rise up. And then if you hit the top line, so you hit the, the, the nine in our first example between that six and nine, and then you see an event there, it means that that event was caused because you topped out in terms of the pressure. If that continuously happens, then what will happen is the technician will say, I think, or your neurologist or whoever it is who's consulting you talking about this, will say, I think we need to increase the pressure. And this is what I've gone through several iterations of. So now I am between 9.6 and 14. And that seems to be a real sweet spot for me where I'm able to consist. I'm not waking up from apnea events anymore. And that seems to be helping massively in terms of my consistency when it comes to sleep. So you can have the reports back and then you can have obviously the, the data that you've got from here, but those are the main adjustments that you'll make from a pressure perspective. But then you also have your humidity. So the humidity of the room that is gonna impact sort of the temperature of the tubing and the piping that is gonna, because if you think about this in the sense of you're having air consistently pushed in, you need to have some way of modulating that dry air being pushed in. And that is through water that you top up Steve with. So Steve has a drink every single night. Yeah, this he is needs part to of hydrated. Have you talked Steve up? Yeah, so Steve needs to be hydrated every single night. And that is impacted by where you're going to be. So obviously when we're in Thailand, the air conditioning was on, so it's 17 degrees. So that was a little bit easier to modulate the temperature because it was a consistent temperature every single time. When you're moving into places such as the UK, it's going to change, right? You can start off in a warmer room if it gets colder outside and the heating isn't on or the insulator isn't on like as effective as it was in the previous time. Um, then that is going to impact, you know, what is going to happen with the humidity. And that can create a dryness in your throat. It can create like dryness around your face. These are things that are, again, you're able to change and adjust and these settings can be adjusted externally or you can adjust them internally based upon the feedback that you're getting mm. yeah it's a, it's certainly a, a learning point for both of us because when you first start getting into it obviously i didn't know <laughs> what you were talking about as i've sort of demonstrated here and had to get that level of understanding as well and it's super important if you are a partner of someone that is either accepting being diagnosed is already diagnosed I personally feel, you know, if there was sort of personal attacks about it or, you know, me saying, oh, why have you got to wear the mark or anything like that, putting yourself in the shoes of the partner. And that's what I always try and do with well, anything that we sort of come across. But it is a life altering thing. And it's that level of acceptance that you need to wear a mask every night. And it's for me, it's like, how would that actually feel? And, and then if I was to sort of say negative things about that it's not a nice thing to do. Whereas, like I've already mentioned, you know, we made it quite fun and I think you look really cute when we wake up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, there we... Keep so he doesn't, he, he doesn't only have Steve, he, he still has the eye mask. So we've got the straps from Steve and then we've got the eye mask and he's obviously in in the clouds, sleeping, dreaming, whatever he's doing. And I wake up and think, oh, look at you. Look at my little dog. It's very sweet. Tattooed all over the gaff. <laughs> but you, you can sort of understand from that point, anyone that's listening that hasn't heard 
about this uh, to this level you can almost feel quite overwhelming now you have an analytical mind so that lends itself to you wanting to understand it more and there could be people listening that don't really have a, a mind that wants to sort of investigate it to the to the degree you have but oh, maybe. yeah but then of course you know when we actually summarize there with the mask and, and the settings there if you know it's not working there is things you can do about that by consulting with the person that's providing the mask and actually looking a little bit deeper into it rather than again thinking oh it's a load of shit you know which which you could do because until you accepted it you resented having it let alone then getting a mask so that's super important but i think also on that note it's important to note that when i was going through transitions of using the one that i first used to then use in the first sample one which was different to then to the original back to the sample back to the original there was huge discrepancies between what my sleep was and i remember having that sleep where i was like oh my god this is what it feels like to sleep properly mm -hmm. and i was so productive like it was like i was on some kind of wild drug that was just that's only at weekends yeah that. no i'm never gonna stop never <laughs> gonna stop you put um, magic powder in Steve, then he just shoots it straight to your face. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Steve, magic time, everyone. But no. So that was actually a thing where it was like the mask would leak. I'd wake up and it'd be just air blowing into my eyes. And I would just rip the mask off and just be like, this cannot be how. So as much as this might sound like a magical journey of, oh, Matt's accepted it really, really well let's face it, it has been 10 years to get to this point, which it shouldn't have. And again, going back to that original point of the question at the very start, mm. what would you do? That would also be encapsulated in it. Um, my geek mode would be incorporated into this as well. So it hasn't been an easy road of doing it. And I have to have those. I have to also ingrain myself in this process because if I don't ingrain myself in this process as enjoying it, as it's something fun, as it's something that I can track and do all of this kind of stuff, then it will either be something that I'm not that asked about or it is what it is. Exactly. And then I'll just, there'll be some mild form of resentment there where at the moment it's like, well, oh, get to see Steve later and it's fine. And I've also fine tuned it and because I'm interested in it, because it is something that isn't something that I feel like I'm being forced to do because I have accepted it is like, okay, cool. Like, let's see what I can play around with then. So let's add this supplement in. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's see how that affects it. Because also now I'm more self-aware ever before as to how my sleep is. And I remind myself consistently how bad it was before. And now I get through a day and I'm like, oh, I didn't think I need a nap today or didn't feel like I was going to pass out while I was just sat doing something. Mm. And that is, again, another thing where every time I'm putting that on, I'm like, tomorrow I'm going to feel way better than I've ever felt before without this thing. Okay, cool. Well, that, to me, that's a worthy trait. Like if you say, I can give you this thing and... The only negative is you have to wear it for this time that you're unconscious and you will feel exponentially better tomorrow. Sound like a good deal? Yeah, sweet, I'm in. Cool, let's do it. Mm. And that is a gradual process, but you have to kind of give yourself over to it. And it's inexplicably helped by you. Again, and this is where I will say, you know, this is what you should look for in, I'm not saying like we're the gold standard of whatever, but we are, but we're not, but we are, but we're not, but we are, but like finding the person who is going to, and this is what you do do very well, like hold me accountable to the stuff. And even if it is a difficult conversation, like we have that conversation and you, I only ever see that you're trying to make me better. What I see in and what I felt from other relationships is I'm trying to be better and someone wants to keep me pigeonholed where I am or is trying to put a ceiling on me. What I do need every now and again is someone to go, yeah, that's good, but maybe you should just tone it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And like maybe, and that's what you do. You throw me in appropriate places, but it's never where I feel like you're trying to just keep me pigeonholed in somewhere. I can then see, oh yeah, you're, you're that logical part of my brain that sometimes gets shut off. <laughs> and because it's you and because you put it away across that way and the same goes for the sleep apnea thing. Like you say, if you give someone shit for having sleep apnea, like in my mind, you're saying, it's a fucking massive inconvenience that you're wearing that thing. You should probably increase your likelihood of having a heart attack or a stroke. To convenience. Like, and, and if that's your view on the person that you're with, then you definitely shouldn't be with that person. Because if it was a case of listening to a sleep apnea machine while I slept next to you or going, 
ah, she might not wake up tomorrow. I'd be like, fucking wear the sleep apnea machine and crank it up. I'll wear headphones to bed. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. Like, that's the, there's there's not even a conversation. And it's already hard enough for that person because trust me, it is hard enough to accept that that's what you're going to wear. Like when I was getting all the leads and everything put onto my face and doing everything else and I might have taken a selfie and posted it. And I was, I, it took me about fucking an hour to post that thing because I was like, yo, this is a part of you accepting this shit and you look absolutely ridiculous. Part of me thought I was going to look like Tony Stark because they started doing all the thing when he was like putting thing. And I was like, shit, do I get that thing in my chest? That'd be amazing. No, you don't. You just look like an absolute lunatic. And it's hard because again, you, you see the people who are wearing it and you think that's an acute snapshot of that, but you have to wear it every single day mm. and you have to wear it whether you feel like it or not. And you have to wear it. And so sometimes I just lie in bed and I'm like, I'm tired. And I feel like I could just go to sleep, but I know that I can't sleep as a normal person. And that's still hard because it's like, I would like to sometimes like just sleep like a normal person. But it's then trying to, like you said about the support network and, and what we have, you know, when you do fall asleep, it's then just, gently waking you up and saying let's put Steve on and it's you yeah. know it, it's tough because I can relate to that but this is what feeds into you know if you are getting shit from your partner for it it's it's a really hard thing to accept anything like this because it is a lifelong thing and you don't realize the implications of you were doing this to build your physique at the start right well yeah that's that's the thing right like and it's upsetting yeah and and it's already a, a fairly big adjustment anyway. And that's the thing now. Like, I don't have those things now where I'm, like, trying to get away with not wearing it. Because, again, I understand now the magnitude of importance of wearing it and also the benefit of doing it. So that was, like, the last part of me resisting doing it. But there's still that thought process there that it would be nice just to go to fucking sleep every now and again, like a, air quotes, normal person, and not run the risk of, you know, increasing your chance of having something negative happen which when you're aware of it and your mind works as mine does it's like okay cool like let's not do that thing so yeah i think what's important to note there as well is that when i said to you like when you have one in a nap if after training or something like this and you're like god go to sleep and i'm not needing a nap i'm going to do some crazy neurotic things that i tend to get up to and i said why don't you just have a nap without steve and initially i didn't understand probably to the, the magnitude that I do now, of I was almost, I guess, thinking out loud, and it's only really just come to me in this this way. But I was like, why don't you do it without, Steve? Because I was thinking it must be really hard to wear a mask all the time. It'd be nice for you not to. Mm. And then you did a few times in the early days. Yeah. And then there was, there was one time, and, and since then it's been the same, that you said, no, I'll put Steve on. Mm if I'm going for a nap so again there is elements of it like you say it's not this this podcast isn't this is the amazing acceptance of sleep apnea and it's all happened straight away but you know for you it's like even if you're having a nap you're going to get set up like you yeah. know it and it's super important to understand you know wherever you're at with your journey or if it's your partner or if this does relate to you any of, of what we're talking to today is take your time with it, take your own time with it. Anything, whether it's bodybuilding, relationships, sleep apnea, all of these things, sometimes you need an adjustment period. And it's like, you know, throwing yourself into a, a prep and then you think, holy fucking shit, what is this? Whereas maybe you do a bit of a maintenance phase first, then you do a little diet, then you do a little growth phase, then you do a prep. You know, to, for a bodybuilding example, it's like, trying to think that overnight right i've got a mask and everything's fine i'm going to wear that it took a long time like you touched on there to get the the settings right mm. to get you in the routine of because you'd go to sleep and i think oh god he's so cute i don't want to wake him up he hasn't slept well and then you know i'd be like okay so he's snoring now okay so what do i do and then it's his sort of back and forth but also you know it's it was for me to take ownership of going, why don't you put Steve on? And like, you can go back to sleep quite quickly. So it's like, you just put him on and then go to sleep. But at first you'd be like, you know, there's almost in your mind of like, oh, I just, I'm really comfortable. And obviously you have to adjust your sleeping 
position as well and we've worked out a pillow and things like this now i think it'd be useful to sort of end on a segment where we talk about sleep as a whole and i think it'd be quite good to actually talk about what we recommend to clients as a sort of i mean it's person specific but like a an overview and a summary of a good example of a bedtime routine and i've touched on this before with Austin, our mentor, and talking about when we did the Importance of Sleep podcast. But since then, I've learned more. And then we've sort of collaborated with, you know, our coaching, we very much align with, with everything. And we've almost brought both of our knowledge together to formulate the, the best we can for our clients in all areas. And sleep-wise... I mean, it, it's this has been going around for years. I think I heard it on a podcast with Josh Bridgman when I first heard about the mm. hot bath or hot shower an hour before bed. Mm. And it when I heard it, I was like, my whole life's changed. <laughs> yeah, and, and when he sort of explained what happens with that concept and that feeding into, you know, what is a bedtime routine? And, oh God, I can't be asked with that and, and whatever. But again, feeding back into, you know, your acceptance with the sleep apnea, looking forward to a sleep routine before we even get into it i believe is is heavily related to the benefits of sleep so for me as you've said on podcast before and i've mentioned it if you cut me this is what you say if you were to cut your veins your blood type would be bb <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh but you know for me, right, it, it, as a competitor, and this, you know, it does transfer into lifestyle bodybuilding as well, but a different degree. I don't want to step on stage knowing that I've left a stone unturned. And that might be a stone that's the size of a grain of dust. But personally, for me, yes, you need enjoyment in, in growth phases and you explore different foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but the basics of bodybuilding and physique development, if you're missing out on the pillars of these, and again, aside from, you know, if something's happening in your life, if there's a family trauma or examples where, okay, you're going to need to make some, you know, adjustments and what have you. When you're in, you know, in the groove and those things aside, if you are truly if this journey is truly everything to you and you're wanting to develop your physique then having a inclination towards a sleep routine that then aids you being able to in off season grow muscle and make improvements to your next stage out in in prep do your best depending on your sleep i know some people that sleep for 10 hours in prep it's a very small percentage but it does happen but protecting your bedtime routine, I personally feel like if bodybuilding is everything to you, that's exciting. And it might not be to normal people, right? But we ain't normal people, guys. You know, we're doing something that is a very small percentage of people and, and you don't realise how small percentage it is. But all you need to do is sit in a cafe and look around you. How many bodybuilders are there? Anyway, I digress. But everything we're doing, a bit back to the resentment, isn't it? If you're a competitor that wants to pursue this sport, that wants to progress your physique, then the basics of fundament and fundamentals of bodybuilding is a focus. Even when you're going through a very, very hard time, holding up to as many of those pillars that we call them as you can is important. So when we feed that into a sleep routine, yes, there's going to be periods where you're like, I don't want to go to bed, you know, and what have you, but if you can the majority of the time uphold sleep hygiene, I remember it used to be called, didn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't see that as much anymore. Then this is going to benefit your physique development journey. Now, it does not only impact your physique, it impacts your mood, your hunger, your hormones, your energy, your performance in the gym. The list literally goes on, and there's a reason why so many people talk about it, and there's a reason why we talk about it in every check-in for pretty much every client because it is king 
it is, you know, and there's a lot of different ways you can, of course, build a bedtime routine. And like I said, it's individual to our clients. And each one of mine, probably similar to you, is a slightly different version. Mm-hmm. You might have a bath, right? So you've got to use a shower. Yes. But yeah, I think. yeah the, the baseline, I'm sure you'll agree, is having a, a cutoff time and a duration of time before bed where you separate yourself, if possible, from work personal life depends what your personal life's like right you know us us separating in in our personal life that's a really nice place to be in it it depends on the person yeah yeah. you might do that with a partner or that this might be a solo thing right but a separation from electronics from blue light essentially from work from things that cause your brain to work is the way i sort of label it is your basic start point for a sleep routine. I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah. And this is where the blue light blockers can come into play if you want to use those as well. So this is where it's like, if you're planning on going to bed at half 10, from, I always recommend a minimum of half an hour, ideally an hour. Is that the same you would say for? Yeah, I would say split test it and see what works for you over mm. that period of time but ideally you want to have some distance between when you're climbing into bed and when you're getting into bed and again it also goes into when you get into bed versus when you're aiming to get to sleep mm. so for some people <clears throat> you will get into bed and then you'll be in bed for a half an hour or an hour before you actually go to sleep and again for some people that might not be beneficial because you want to associate bed as the place where you go to sleep not necessarily the place where you roll around and just do whatever it is that you're doing for an hour well yeah you can roll around like that like those are the two areas that you identify as bedtime right playtime and sleep time and those are the two things but if you sit in bed and this is why you know that i've got the thing in bed i was just gonna say that yeah like i would you beat me to it every now and again so we're like should you you do our laptops like to be just just to sit in bed comfortable sort of thing Yeah, yeah 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 And I will be like, no, because I've been there before. And then I, I get into bed and I think about work and I'm like, no, this is not a good thing. Like, that's just for me personally. Like, yeah, you I've can do it. it. No, you can do it. But this is a great example of... Association. Yeah, association. If I work in bed, I will hands down think about work exponentially more. And therefore, I'll go to bed and then I'll be like, right, I'll do that program and then I'll do is this. It... And then I'll wake up. Are you talking in your sleep or are you doing a check-in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that's the high likelihood of that happening. And then I will wake up and I will think about all the stuff that I've been either dreaming about or subconsciously thinking about. And then I will wake up being awake and then I'll be sat down here doing my work on laptop. And that will yeah. that will happen and regardless of I'm using the CPAP or whatever. Yeah. Because that's just my mind. And again, this is why that separation thing is so important before you'll go into bed is your time and your distance of time between doing nothing or doing something that is going to make you think about like if half an hour is you stop work or you stop watching tv and then you're going to bed or yeah and and instagram is a big one right Uh, i always use this social test of wherever we are and we could be anywhere in the world and who's watching my story at that particular time and you can do great things where you just like set a story to release at a certain time and then people will be like oh you watched it at this time and it's like you shouldn't have been awake at that period of time (laughs) And these are the same people who are like, yeah, my sleep's fine. It's great every single time. You're like, no, you're scrolling every time you, you wake up. You just like my photo at three in the morning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what, <laughs> what, what time do you, you like stuff, right? Because people will note. And this is a big thing for me. Don't have your phone in the bedroom or don't have your phone close to your bed. Charge your phone. And the only time that I brought it in was when we were having, when we didn't have a fan. Oh, then we didn't have a fan and we were playing the noise through the phone just so I could kind of change it from there. But then it was further away from the bed, so I couldn't check it, so I couldn't get up because I will still break this rule myself and my phone's next to me. It's that flicker of interaction, bar, you know, aside from it being blue light, you you see a notification, yeah. And then you're like, oh, and you know, I, I get excited about things, particularly with the podcast. When we're in Thailand, it was tricky because of the time difference. So if a client had messaged me back, I would still go on my phone and this is where I wear the blue light blockers and sort of going into, into a bit of a tangent here with, with that is some of our clients need to like James had to work to one in the morning for a whole week, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of away from the grain as it were for him. 
now that was because he was doing overseas work so it's like so how can you help someone that actually needs to work till they sort of drop and this is where i say it's completely person dependent on what the sleep regime looks like and what the sleep routine looks like i understand not everyone can be rigid you know if you've got children if you've got other commitments maybe that's something that needs to to be a priority what i always liken this to and and whether or not this this comes across in the right direction but as matt said you know i try and say it how it is in a critical thinking manner but you've got to understand if you are looking to progress your physique and continue to do that as a competitor it is and this is where people label it as a selfish sport but if you are doing everything in your power to improve your physique that requires a fuck ton of time and it requires commitment to the things that maybe would skew what else you can prioritize it's probably the best way to say it and it's just made me think about, and this is a massive tangent, but when we spoke about, you know, after my last prep and we, I went into prep, we went into prep, I went into prep two weeks into our relationship. Mm -hmm. So we had two weeks and we had a holiday and whatever. And then, you know, well, you know what I'm, I'm like in a prep and to a certain degree in off season, obviously the tick, the ticking of the boxes decreases to a certain degree, but you know, Matt had never experienced someone in prep and I'd never experienced someone that gave a shit about me in a prep. So we had to learn together while I'm heading into a severe deficit. Anywho, off the back of that, it was like there was some quite tough conversations with both of us getting upset into, I said to you, as soon as that, that hammer drops, the fictitious hammer, I that's my priority you're not my priority. Now, even saying that out loud, it's quite upsetting because it's it's different. Like I hadn't experienced what we have. So it was like two weeks in, I'm a bodybuilder. You either fucking like it or you lump it. And that is how it was. You know, I don't need to beat around the bush and you know that. And it wasn't until sort of after the prep, it was like, holy shit. And that is, that example relates into, you know, the sleep routine. I'd say to Matt, well, you can stay up and work. I'm going to bed because... I'm not turning up on stage knowing that I just stayed up for you. The priority is bodybuilding. The priority is that fucking 10 minutes on stage and that's the end of it. And this this feeds into, you know, what are you willing to put into these things that might seem basic or boring or whatever else it is for when you step on stage in two years time or however long it is. Mm -hmm. And this feeds into the sleep routine. And I'm not saying, you know, that it should be that way. But there is an element of, and I'm very lucky to have you and, and you understood that and we've spoken about it and, and what that requires. And if and when I go into another prep, how that will look, because we've done the, the sort of, we've done that now. But there is elements of it, isn't there? It's it's hard to beat around the bush with that. Because if the, the physique presents, depending on what you do, well, yeah, this is the thing, like with bodybuilding, right? It's it's not some well, it is something that you can do half assed, but then your results will be half assed unless you're genetically gifted in your there is circumstances and you're competing PDs. against yeah, exactly. like but it's a it's a sport or whether you view it as a sport or not. Well, well that's that's a that's a that's a topic, yeah. One hundred percent. But it's a thing that requires you to monitor your sleep, your training, your nutrition your recovery, like all of these things at a very, very high level. And you need to move and manipulate these things. If you want to do something casually and you want to do something that is, you know, competitive to a certain degree, like you could be a table tennis player or a net player or something like that. Like you don't, you just have to turn up and you go and play a game and that's it. It's a different but if you're bodybuilding... And if you're competitive bodybuilding, then you have to, and this is something that I explain to the fighters that I like do their nutrition for and their sort of weight cuts for, is if you, because they're notorious for not really giving a shit necessarily about their nutrition to a certain degree, <laughs> or like their sleep, and they just need to, yeah, and they just need to do this. And it's like, okay, 
here's two dynamics you can turn up on the day be exhausted tired and the other guy is ready to punch you in the face and feels really good about it or vice versa you can be energized ready to rock and roll and worst case scenario so is he inside scoop he won't be because he'll have some more on nutritionist or no one at all who who doesn't know about it happens every time and we can be ahead of our game so now think about that in the sense of you are looking to present your best physique your best physique as you say for 10 minutes after maybe a couple of years and it all depends on you providing the freshest look to your physique now how do you think that's going to happen when you've battered yourself over a 8 10 12 16 20 30 40 week prep if you haven't looked after your sleep and everything else and this is where it comes back down to that consideration of the person you are with and i know this is something you talk about on the pod where it's like if you're getting into a relationship or you're in a relationship and that person hasn't experienced you in a prep or you go into a prep it's an honest conversation because you are changing the dynamic of what is happening i.e the conversations that we had prior to our relationship the times that we spent together while we were friends and then the holiday was drastically different but equally i understand what it looks like when you're dieting not to the same degree as to what you take prep to because you're the only person i've ever seen do it to the level that you do do it and i don't say that blow smoke up your ass because you don't need it if anything you don't believe it anyway we do a bit more now because i keep saying it but (laughs) yeah, yeah but it's it's just a fact and the thing is you have to be accepting of that but there will also be aspects that the other person has to be accepting as well i.e i snore a lot xyz all of the things well, that i have cool, isn't it? yeah but it's it's just a continuum of acceptance that you go through because you want to spend time together and you want the best for each other and there will be times where you have to rein me in or I have to rein you in mm. and we have to have conversations but it's not a don't do that it's a this is what's happening this is what you're going through and this is a consideration for people to have and this is also a consideration for you to have when you are with your partner and if we are talking about a sleep time routine or a bedtime routine respect yeah but how many people do you know in a workplace who and this is outside of bodybuilding if you're a bodybuilder and you go to work and you work with people how many people do you know who wake up in the morning or go to work in the morning they're like i feel so refreshed today i had such a great sleep last night fucking hardly anybody everyone's tired stressed coffee good night's sleep most people are reaching to the coffee yeah exactly so it's a prop isn't it but if you can therefore enhance your time with your partner and have more time in bed where you are going to have a wind down routine, where you're going to cuddle or nice. spend a little bit more time yeah, together, yeah. where you're not both glued to your phone, where you're not just watching TV to pass the time or whatever it might be. And then you can both wake up refreshed and then you can both maybe crank out your work a little bit better than you were before, maybe be in a little bit of a better mood maybe just have a more optimistic outlook in terms of how you're feeling. Maybe that encourages them to move a little bit more, exercise a little bit more, not that they need to, but maybe they want to, or they're more inclined to do so. And then when you do get quality time together at a weekend or your day off, you're both going to feel better about it. Again, sleep isn't just something to optimize because you're a bodybuilder or you want the best out of your physique. No, no, I can say it's energy, mood. Everything. It's, yeah, hunger. Yeah, massive one. Yeah, and of course... I've got to say this on the quad. I haven't said this this thus far. You say that thus far. Mm. There's a reason why sleep deprivation is used to interrogate people mm. and to expose the truths of whatever the interrogator is after. And I always remember that because it's so fucking true. What happens when you're sleep deprived? It Not a lot. You know what it's like as an example a fictitious example when you like when we flew to thailand all of that travel and then you got jet lag you just feel shit right mm. yeah, yeah so when we relate this back to building a sleep routine and, and being excited for that or enjoy it or find some level of acceptance is the theme today that this is a thing i think the the main resistance i come across is that no my sleep's fine but could your sleep be better and there's lots of things that can enhance that aside from a sleep routine if you've lived with your sleep being a certain way have you experienced feeling better your version of feeling good every day might be 
my version of feeling fucking horrendous, but you have done the what you've done for X amount of time, and it's like I don't I don't need to worry about sleep. I don't need to worry about sleep. Now, there there's sort of so many tangents we could go even just on that sort of that statement, as it were. But when we're talking, you know, most of the audience that are going to be listening are bodybuilders or competitors, mm-hmm. or even people looking to enhance their lifestyle. People looking at sleep apnea, you know potentially that could be a, a knock-on effect of that then it's it's almost back to and this is more ringing true to competitors what are you leaving to chance is what we talk about isn't it okay yeah, yeah. so could this be a fucking good thing let's just play it straight could it be a good thing guys that you spend 30 to 60 minutes before bed enjoying something passive in your life taking a step back reading a book touching your partner if that's appropriate watching tv if you want to with blue i wear blue light blockers Mm -hmm. i might do a story tonight with them one just to prove to prove to the game she does wear them yeah we look really cool with our sleep house steve (laughs) Steve and uh blue light blockers (laughs) yeah anyone ever breaks in they'll be like it's okay guys we'll leave you we'll leave you really weird um could, could this, you know, in summary, be a good thing that you have a sleep routine that you look forward to, taking a step back from, you know, what life can bring at times? Is it going to make a massive difference to your physique? That's person dependent. Of course, when we work with clients, we can, we get data and we can go, okay, so how's your sleep been? It's like, oh, last night my sleep was shit. When they check in again, they're night, a good night's sleep. Okay, your physique looks different. You know, that's that's something we work with clients for. But this is back to if you're competing, are you leaving a grain of sand unturned? That is up to you. How when you step on stage, do you wholeheartedly want to know that you've done everything in your power? And that is a question for you. It's not for me to tell you what to do. It's just my personal approach to what competing is for me. And like I say, in the different phases, there's different things you can push and pull. But the importance of sticking to your parameters and your plan, if your ultimate goal is to continue improving your physique, it's going to be super important. When we feed that into you know, lifestyle clients and looking to improve their health. What does sleep do? What does a sleep routine do? It improves your health. So in it, in every aspect, you know, that grain of sand could still be appropriate to someone that is very, very focused on improving their health, on improving their body composition. You haven't got to step on stage to validate that. But I've got clients that take the lifestyle coaching arguably more seriously than competitors I've met and that's not to but it's true you know we've got some lifestyle clients that are very very fucking focused don't we yeah you know it's to the nth degree for sure they're very similar to your mindset and my mindset they're doing something they're doing it you know they're not stepping on stage but they want to do it and it's important to understand what you want to get from whether it's competing or from your body transformation journey but also to look at the the effects of sleep what that does for your longevity above all else as a person and how it affects those things like energy mood relationships productivity performance the list goes on now i think a good way to sort of to round it up because i realize we've been on a bit of a tangent of how important sleep is guys if if you haven't got the memo yet we've done a shit job but aside from where i mentioned having a hot shower or hot bath an hour before bed so essentially what happens there is your body then auto regulates temperature and you start to cool down over that hour which could be less if you know again whatever you can sort of put aside then you cool down and you're I think it was it was put across as optimized for bed but optimal is a word that we are on the fence with right but that's that's the theory behind it correct me if I'm wrong yeah essentially and this ties into your your temperature of your bedroom yeah which essentially is an extension of yeah you're looking to essentially draw up your external temperature from the hot shower which drops your internal temperature and then as you cool down and you go into a cooler room, that temperature is 
mediated between the two and then you have a better sleep and this is because between like 16 17 degrees is a good temperature for you to be sleeping within mm. which is where our temperature was like 17 degrees in thailand so, so and you can modulate it and have it consistent and this is where people will notice a difference between when it is very cold or very hot in the Love summer the and summer. in yeah and in the uk where the the insulation can kind of do too good of a job and we don't have air con and it gets very very hot and yeah. you could know that you're asleep and this is something from the sleep apnea machine perspective that i've seen impacted based upon that and that's both from the humidity because if it skyrockets and changes it too much and the humidity of the machine isn't changed but equally me as a person i'm quite warm anyway being assisted made that even more and and say so pretty hot yeah. and yeah. that then has an impact on like the seat the sleep side of stuff so yeah. that's important and we obviously have a discrepancy between our temperatures as well so yeah i get cooler although being assisted has changed that to a certain degree and when we then look at that that sort of that theory what i also like to sort of add some substance to that with as well is that the reason it's set for a certain period of time before bed is that you start to get used to that being your time when you start to wind down. And there is psychology behind that. There is also that if you have your hot shower, hot bath at nine and you're winding down and going to sleep at 10, you start to build. It's like a body clock, right? When you get up at 4 a.m. every day, suddenly you get up and you don't need an alarm. Mm. It's a similar theory behind it. And I truly believe, and this is where it's looking forward to it, that's your time, guys. Like, that is your time to fucking take a step back. And in life, you know, essentially, there's so much going on all the time. There's a lot of challenges for a lot of people. That's like this precious time. And I really love it when a client's able to sort of see it like that. And me, mindset-wise, that's how I needed to frame it. It was like, no, this is my time. And that's a precious time for you. Like I say, there's going to be things that affect it at times in life. And that is, it is what it is. And we do our best within that. But when we actually lay merit on that, if you're doing your your best to uphold that 85% of the time and the other 15 is when you have to work late and there's there's no getting away from that or a family emergency comes up and you've got to help out, the 85% that is solid is going to be so much better than, oh, well, you know, that 85% potential was actually 35% because I want to be on Instagram until I literally hit the pillow, because I want to do X, Y, Z. Is Instagram important enough when you step on stage and you forego the, the, the basic principles of things like sleep, or even, you know, that can transfer into a lot of things, and this is an extreme example, but it's it's trying to work out what, what's important to you, and I fucking love Instagram you're on the fence you know it can be both good and bad as we know but if that's the thing that's drawing you in from this sleep routine I've been there I'm not saying I haven't but it's those types of things it's like can you have the ability to step away from the vir- virtual reality essentially and and focus on yourself and that can also and I won't go into a tangent but what is your mindset and are you happy in yourself and are you comfortable in yourself to allow time and space to do something you enjoy outside of interaction online tv you know blue light blockers whatever you know if you want to use those but can you read can you journal can you draw can you do a puzzle can you spend time with your partner can you just relax do some stretching can you do something that gets you ready for bed and then within that sort of hour or half an hour we've we've spoken about the main things But obviously titrating down the fluid you drink after a certain time in the evening, this is something we sort of trial with with clients and and we worked out ourselves, you know, most of the time sipping after sort of 6 p.m. is a good idea if if you're heading to bed at 9, 10 p.m. Not utilising stimulants after 1, 2 p.m. Ideally, if you're heading for that 9 to 10 p.m., all those little sort of things that are, are quite obvious It's checking in with those and actually, you know, thinking back during your day and trying to almost, if you can, down-regulate stimulation from anything. 
leading towards bed. Now, it, life isn't optimal for anyone. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a top athlete or whatever, you know, things come up. But the sleep routine, trying to build it to suit you, and this is where it's person dependent, this will help your sleep. And I can't stress it enough. If we have to work late, we have a rest of sleep. It, it's literally as simple as that, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And I think this is... This ties into, yeah, sometimes it will happen. Like the example that you used with James was he had a challenge and he had to start at a certain time and then that challenge had to be done at that time. There was no other way around it however on reflection because of the stuff we've done on sleep and because of the stuff that's improved over a period of time mm -hmm. his reflection was it's not worth doing that at that time zone again moving forward oh, because of great. how he felt that. yeah because of how he felt around it and that's learning then isn't it yeah and that's adapting this so the thing is if you don't have and there's a lot of stuff that you can take from when you're a kid and you know be that child stereotypes right eat your vegetables go to bed at night have a bedtime have a wait time that do carry through and the thing is there's parkinson's laws which is essentially if you allow exponential amounts of time for something time will just run away with you and you will fill that time for whatever so if you have a task that actually requires you to do it in 30 minutes but you've got three hours it'll take three hours so do you have a start and an end time to your day do you have a time where you say this is my bedtime this is my wake time do you can you bookend your days like that and some people and again i have clients you have clients who do like shift work yeah. and will have rotations doesn't mean that there's one example of that it means that on the shift where you do six to ten or you do ten to six or you do whatever have one for each one of those things have whatever your routine or your ritualistic behavior is and then work back from that so have a start time have an end time to your day that's your bedtime your wake time and ideally you want to be surfing between seven and nine hours and again that's like based upon what you can actually get if you can't get more than that and there are going to be people out there who are like i work like 14 hours a day okay cool like and i have to commute there and back and do this okay cool well then your next step is your sleep is five hours a day or six hours a day Okay, well, how can you get the best quality sleep that you possibly can? And this is where, time? just to reflect as well, this is where I say the grain of sand. Mm. It's person dependent. Yeah. So you're doing everything in your power, depending on your lifestyle. And this is where it needs to be drawn into. It's what's appropriate for the person, like you say, mm. how to say that there, because it's like the grain of sand is different for everyone. Yeah. So if you're a shift worker, but you're a competitive athlete, it can still work for sure. Mm. But you still have those those fundamentals and the priorities to make it the best you can for your scenario. And this is this goes into the people that you are around and the people who you watch and the people who you look at on social media or the people who you're around. Because if you're watching and following people who are able to get nine or ten hours sleep the people that you mentioned or even seven to nine but you can only do five or six you cannot afford to spend the same amount of time on instagram or doing the other things if it is a high priority to you as those people can so those people who are off doing xyz or they're messaging you back x amount of time and you know that they have more availability to sleep or their lifestyle is set up a little bit more favorable to be a more optimal bodybuilder than you an optimal being they can train more for it flexibly they can train more consistently they can afford to run higher gear or whatever it might be in that regard you have to look at your own individual circumstances and this is where we do this with a client on a client by client basis we aren't saying you have to sleep nine hours if they can only sleep five if we make that sleep... five the best possible exactly <laughs> and that's the whole point of this is ask yourself the question and this is something that we we you know i've spoken to people about like people who drink caffeine past a certain amount of time and they're like oh i sleep fine and you're like no you you definitely have like unless you just don't metabolize caffeine in which case you don't need it which you do metabolize it then it is going to sit in your system and maybe you can process it a little bit faster but if you're taking your last cup of coffee at 7 p.m trust me it is impacting your sleep the fact that you don't notice it and this is where there are these things and you are going to have to pay a certain amount of attention to them if you want to improve your sleep. And this is where I use it as a value exchange, right? And it's, it's as you get leaner, you're going to have to exchange more things. You're going to have to kiss goodbye to more calories. You're going to have to kiss goodbye to more nutritional flexibility. Yeah. But like on your value exchange of getting leaner, 
how much do you value the food that you're saying goodbye to or the social occasion variability that you're having to say goodbye to versus getting leaner? And for some people, it's like, and I know that you're all like grinning because you're like, well, fuck it, fuck everything. I, 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 won't eat. I will get everything shredded for whatever. And <laughs> that is legitimately true. Funny. But for some people, there will be a point where they're like, this isn't fun anymore and I'm not enjoying it. Yeah. And the additional veins that I'm going to see in my abs aren't worth this. And that's going to be where these things will come into your life. If you're saying that waking up at 3 a.m., you have to scroll on Instagram and that's where you're getting your soul enjoyment from in life then it's not worth it. You carry on doing that and impacting your sleep. That's absolutely fine for you to do. However, if you're kidding yourself and thinking that you need to be scrolling Instagram at 3 a.m. because that's what you've done because you can't sleep as opposed to, okay, get up and sit in a chair that is close to your bed. Or lay there and relax. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And sit and read for a little bit of a book or something of that nature or just sit there. And I've done this with clients who suffer with insomnia for a period of time I mean, and they were like, around, but, yeah that's yeah. The, comp- like and this was alongside what they were speaking to with their specialist but we implemented and integrated a lot of these thought processes with them and we and this is one of the things that i took from it in terms of the association with not working in bed or bed only being for one thing or another and that's where now it's such a positive affirmation and association so if you are associating bed with okay i can't sleep so now i get my phone straight away yeah. and i check my phone and then you get the dopamine hit and then you scroll and then you watch and then you do this you're stimulating yourself there's no physical and it's enjoyable guys. like we're not saying it's not enjoyable that's but... why we can't have our phone yeah, in the bedroom. yeah that's... like it's exactly the same reason so you just be, remove be so disciplined you just remove the temptation you put your charger for your phone downstairs and if you have a charger at work that you need to take from home, buy another charger, have it at work. Don't ever move that one from downstairs. And then every time you get like back from work and you have to go and charge your phone, it gets charged in the kitchen or the lounge or wherever it is. That That's is why we can't have donuts in the house. No, just buy them on the way back. Oh, Uber. You didn't Uber. know about Uber. that, did you? <laughs> anyway. What I will wrap up with where... We, we, well, yeah. Oh, you... Where we're referencing, you know, the grain of sand analogy that I've I've come up with today and, and what you can do to do your best to protect a sleep routine and build a sleep routine, essentially, is that in those examples of when thing, things need to adjust to suit commitments that are a priority as well as bodybuilding, there is an extension of allowing yourself to then be able to be flexible where you need to but then make amendments to still be optimizing or whatever word we want to use as efficiently as possible and an example of that for shift workers for if something comes up in examples where we have needed to work late and and you know we've got commitments outside of our day-to-day is that actually if you know these things are coming up planning for that so when we've had to work late and it's more of a rest of sleep we've then said okay so the next day we're probably going to bed a bit earlier and we'll have a nap yeah as an example yeah and you know this is by no means us saying well everything has to be 100 percent, or you're going to look shit because it's not but there needs to be a priority essentially on what you want to get from it and what you're willing to put in. There's always this, this, Mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is, right? You know, you can't expect to have magic without having to learn some spells, but it is, it's super important to then be able to be adaptive, but be effective and think ahead essentially with, with everything we're talking about with regards to the importance of sleep, because there is examples, but that grain of sand, it's not your normal routine, but you can still do everything to the best of your ability to ensure we're not leaving the grain of sand unturned. Yes, there's been a bit of disruption, but this is what I've done to facilitate that. Not, oh, that was a restless night's sleep. Well, fuck it, I'll be all right tomorrow. Mm. That's where it's that ratio of how important is it to you? Because I, I know, you know, in examples where we've, we have had to work late and then we know that sleep's probably not going to be as it normally is. I'll say to you and I'll press you and you agree, you know, it's like, okay, so we wind down earlier. If we feel we can, we have a nap or maybe if you can, the next day you sleep in a bit longer or, you know, pushing and pulling. 
I'm not expecting you to live in a prison for fucking 10 years because you want to be the best physique. But there needs to be a level of ownership, guys, because if you're saying you want to bring the best physique to stage and do everything you can in your power to be a bodybuilder, there's got to be actions behind that, not just words. 100%. Mm. That's good. Well, of course, if you have enjoyed this episode, as always, sharing it on your stories, that was a bit of a to finish it. Mm. But it is, you know, it's it's a message that I feel passionate about. Not everyone wants to do it, guys, and there's a reason for that, for sure. Everybody want to be a bodybuilder, but no one want to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Said by Ronnie right Cutler, famous bodybuilder. 0.3% body fat. That's not possible, Ronnie. Bikini competitor. Yeah, it is. No, it's, not no, it's not possible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if you'd like to share that last bit on your story, we'd be very grateful. Oh, yeah. Now, Thank Matt's, Ronnie Cutler. Matt's actually in the process of creating an ebook about sleep. Oh. So... You, of course, will put that on your Instagram when it is ready. But if if anyone's listened and you would like to have access to that, of course, it's an e-book, so it's free of charge. Well, they are free of charge, aren't they, normally? You've got to show me your next seven nights worth of sleep, (laughs) and then I will dictate whether you are uh, enabled to have it. Um, I know sometimes you can get ones you pay for, but generally speaking, it's essentially it's something that you've created over time and... You know, we like to, yeah. Be you gotta sleep to, on it. Yeah, it's it's nice Don't to be able to offer thing. You know, if these things that we've spoken about has helped someone and they want to have access to that, then of course you can message Matt on Zigram. I will put your Instagram in the description. Thank you. And of course, guys, good night. Although this gets released at six a.m. on a Monday morning, and farewell. Yeah, from me, Sarah, and Steve. See you next week. Bye. Bye.